Welcome to the Talking the Talk podcast, where we'll be exploring items of automotive technology and their journey into mass production. I'm Kevin Reed, the founder of Ireland Made, where we celebrate stories of Irish transport past and present, and this is our podcast. I'm delighted to welcome my co-host, automotive engineering consultant, Mike Keane. Mike's consultancy delivers bespoke and sustainable transport solutions, and previously Mike has led vehicle development programs for Ford, Williams Formula One Advanced Engineering, Nissan, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Aston Martin. Mike has also worked on projects as diverse as hybrid supercars to off-road electric vehicles. But what is most impressive for me, Mike worked on the James Bond movie Spectre, and he worked on the baddies car, the Jaguar CX-75. In each episode, we're going to be examining vehicles that range from the 1921 German Rumpfler right up to what Tesla and Lucid are doing today. In this episode, we're going to be exploring the history of steering systems. Hiya, Mike. Hi, Kevin. So in the previous Trendsetter episode of our podcast, we talked about the early cars having a tiller and the 1894 Panhard 4 horsepower being the first car with a steering wheel. So where did the steering wheel go next, Mike? Yeah, uh, so from nearly the very first car, steering wheels have always had a steel substrate. So the, the, the actual material inside the, the rim of the steering wheel is steel. And initially they were covered in wood. And then in the 1950s, this was replaced by plastics like Bakelite. And it was also replaced by leather. And then finally, vinyl and rubber overmolding started to appear in the 70s and the 80s. And that's what we still have today. Right. But I mean, steering wheels, it didn't change very much for many, many years, did they? No, not really. I mean, up until the 1980s, the steering wheel had the function of changing the direction of the car. And that was the only function it had. Increasingly, cabin controls such as the horn, the radio, the cruise control, they were added to the steering wheel. And that was really made possible through the the use of two devices that were um, invented or came to prominence in the 80s either a component called a clock spring or a component called a slip ring. And these are electrical devices. So they allow electrical current or electronic signal to pass from the rotating steering wheel to the fixed steering column. Right. That sounds really interesting. So tell me about the steering column. Well, the steering column, initially, it was just a a rotating shaft, just a steel shaft going from the back of the steering wheel um, down to the steering system. In the 1950s then, you know, we spoke about this in the safety episode that there was an increasing focus on safety. And, you know, we talked about what companies were doing with the steering wheel itself. So in 55, on their lifeguard system, Ford had a steering wheel with flexible spokes that would deform in an impact. And the 55 Citroen DS, that had a, had a single spoke on the steering wheel for the same reason. But in 1959, the Mercedes-Benz W111, the Fintail, that was the first car with a collapsible steering column. And then the first US car with a collapsible steering column was in 1967 on the Chevrolet Chevy Model 2. So a a collapsible steering column is that instead of the steering wheel deforming when the, the driver hits it, the actual column itself retracts out of the way or in a frontal impact, it, it collapses, you know, from the frontal motion. And in 1968, the FMVSS, so the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, they made collapsible steering columns mandatory on all cars. Right. That's when the, the first real big safety systems begin to, began to come in. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. So how did the column move then the steered wheels? Well, the earliest cars use a, a very simple lever called a Pitman arm. So the column is a rotating shaft, steel shaft going from the back of the steering wheel. And onto that was fixed a, a simple lever arm that was sticking off the end of the column. And as the column rotates, that arm rotated with the column and tie rods were attached to that pitman arm and they were pushed left and right. And they pushed the uprights, which turned the wheel. Very simple system. In fact, you can easily see that system today if you if you look at a go-kart. So, you know, your typical higher cart or your you know racing go-kart, they've got a little triangular lever at the bottom of the steering column. And that's the pitman arm pushing those tie rods um, left and right. So really simple, really effective. Really simple, really effective. The problem with the pitman arm, and you might recognize it from the... Uh, from the steering uh, of a cart is it's quite heavy. That's one thing that's problematic. The other problem with the, yeah, that's right. You need your sort of, you get, you get that arm pump at the end of a few minutes, right? The other thing you get, the other problem with a pitman arm is that 
the rotational movement is not translated directly into linear movement. So we want the tie rods to move left and right, you know, it just translate directly left and right. But because they're attached to a rotating device, so the inner end of the tie rod is rotating with the steering column. Well, that means that the steering output changes speed with the steering input, or in simple terms, as you turn the steering wheel, the steered wheels on the road are not turning at the same rate. They're changing the rate. So that's that's one problem with it. Right. And then also the steering effort that comes back, it's quite high. So the forces in the wheels are being put right back into the, into the driver's hands. So the Ford Model T, that had a pitman arm, but it was the first car to have a planetary gearbox. So it was a, a geared solution. So that meant that the... There was a four to one ratio, which meant that the steering wheel turned four times slower than the wheels were actuated. And also that steering effort was reduced. So that steering effort must have been spectacularly reduced for the driver. Yeah, it was it was it was a it was a big part of that reducing of the effort. So the gearing of that steering system has always been a a key factor in the design of the of the steering systems Mm -hmm. in the. 1920s, there was the invention of what was called a steering box, and they tried various types of gearing. So a steering box, they're all based on a similar principle where at the bottom of the steering column, there's a cog, and that cog is driving a worm, or maybe it's pushing a cam, or it's pushing a roller. So when the column rotates, the cog rotates a different column. So it just drives another shaft, and that second shaft pushes the pitman arm. So the actuation speed still changes, but because you've got a pitman arm, but there's a reduced force. So we get we get that benefit from it. So these steering boxes, they were relatively cheap to manufacture. They're pretty robust and they more or less provided consistent steering feel um, when they were maintained. But even with a lot of, you know, even with the correct maintenance, there's a lot of moving parts in there. So you've got lag in the system. So one of the problems with steering boxes is, is that sort of, vague wavy steering wheel that you know the steering wheel doesn't feel like it's always connected to the front wheels yeah it's old-fashioned movies and the guy's basically doing this it's exactly that yeah it's line yeah 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 and then uh, so in in 1940 the cadillac model 72 that was the first car launched with what's called a recirculating ball steering box still has a worm in gear but the the spacing of the gear threads are wide enough to allow a track of ball bearings to run in it. And yeah. those ball bearings, they reduce the friction and they reduce some of that lag, um, which it kind of improve the feel. But at the same time, there's still a lot of moving components. So there's still a lot of wear. And without power assisted steering, the steering effort is still actually quite heavy. Yeah. So generally, US cars moved from a steering box to a recirculating ball steering. And it was the most common steering actuation type in US cars right up until the 1990s um, and later still on trucks. And in fact, the Jeep Wrangler today, it still uses that system. Whereas in Europe, the trend by and large was to move from steering boxes to rack and pinion steering. Oh, wow. That's interesting that the Jeep Wrangler still uses that system. Any reason for them holding on to it? Or? It's cheap. Cheap. Simple as that. <laughs> it's cheap. I should have known that answer before I asked the question. <laughs> okay. So when was rack and pinion uh, in, in, introduced? 1933. The BMW 303 was the first production car to use rack and pinion. So in a rack and pinion system, the steering column has a gear at the end of it, but instead of it turning another shaft, it's now pushing a geared, a flat geared rack. Uh, so it's pushing it left and right. So in this case, you we are you know, translating that rotational movement directly into uh, into a straight line movement. So that's that's it's much better from a from a, a performance point of view. So the steering column rotation um, it's translated directly into that linear motion at a constant speed. That's the other benefit of it. So that system was generally adopted in Europe and Japan through the the fifties and sixties. The first U.S. car with rack and pinion steering was the the ill fated. 1971 Ford Pinto. Yeah, so we spoke about that. We spoke about that before, yeah. Yeah, we know that car very well from our safety episode. Um, the thing about the steering rack, though, so so we've now got a superior system, right? So the rack is superior. Oh. But there's more to engineering the rack than simply putting it where it can fit in the car. So the position of the rack 
and the length of the tie rods, they are actually critical in terms of the design of the steering, particularly because of two phenomena. One is called Ackerman steering and the other is called bump steer. Bump steer and Ackerman. So what is Ackerman steering? Ackerman. Okay, so Ackerman steering is a design methodology for steering that you know all cars try to use or use. So if you imagine that a car is traveling through a corner, it's following an arc. It's following the arc of that corner. But actually, the wheels on the outside are following a greater radius than the wheels on the inside. So they're actually following a different arc. And now on top of that, the front wheels are the steered wheels. They've actually pivoted a little bit in order to steer the car in order to change direction. So actually, all four wheels follow a different radius. So if you, you know, if a car, if you went around in a circle on sand, you would see four tracks in the sand as it goes around. So this was all discovered. Really, that's how it was discovered, right? So in four-wheel horse-drawn carriages that had a fixed axle, when they were turning on gravel, the, the steer wheels would kind of drag through the gravel, right? Because they, you know, they were they were they were trying to be forced to go on the same corner. And of course, sort of those neatly raked gravel yards that were in front of those large houses, that was unsightly. So the designers of the carriages at the time, they looked at that and they realized that actually the wheels that were steered need to steer, need to turn at different angles. So the axle was invented that allowed those steering wheels to pivot at different angles. And that's called, called Ackerman steering. And the Ackerman steering is to, dictated by the position of the steering rack to ensure that the, the wheels have actually turned at the correct angle. Right, because uh, thank you for that. It's a great explanation because we've actually come across Ackerman steering before in um, on Ireland May Channel on season one, episode 24. We did a soapbox gravity racer built by the great Ken Doonan and he utilized Ackerman steering in his soapbox to give him more, a more accurate steering feel. Brilliant. So bump steer, take us through bump steer. Okay, so... The front wheels are steered with tie rods. So we've got tie rods on the end of the of the rack that are those tie rods are being pushed in and out. Um, and that's what steers the uprights. At the same time that the wheels are being steered, the suspension is rising and falling. So the suspension, when it rises and falls, it, it, it moves in an, in an arc of motion. And we'll talk about that in, in actually in the next uh, episode on suspension. Yeah. But that means that those tie rods, they're following a whole range of motions. So they're moving in and out. And they're also moving up and down at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, if the tie rod position and the length of the tie rod, if they don't match the arc of the motion of the suspension, when a wheel goes over a bump, there's a possibility that the steering tie rod can actually pull that steered wheel and change its steering angle very slightly, um, you know, in very, very micro movements, it can actually pull the steering. And that's called bump steer. So what's actually happening is, you as a driver, you're inputting, you're, you're turning the steering wheel, you give it a certain amount of input. As the wheel goes over a bump, one of the wheels is actually changing position. And it gives a very wayward handling characteristic because as, as you can imagine, one of the wheels is effectively doing its own thing, right? It's not going where you want it to go. And that can only be rectified by positioning the steering rack co correctly. Must be terribly annoying. <laughs> very annoying I, I saw an example one time on a rally car that a, was a it was a Vauxhall Nova that had a very powerful engine and they put a 300 horsepower engine into it incredibly quick and the guys just could not keep it on a straight line when they were driving because when they were going down rough roads the, the car was bouncing all over the place and that was because when they changed the engine they moved the steering rack and, and they, they brought in very severe bump steer into it Wow. All right. So, so there's some lessons there. So yeah. any, other, any other steering characteristics? Well, like the geometry design of the steering system, it's very complex. And really, we're only just lightly touching on it today. So there's two other um, real important aspects. One is called caster. The other is called camber. Camber is, if you looked in at the front of the wheels, it's the lean angle of the wheel. And really... Yeah, that's right. We'll we'll talk about camber actually in the next episode on suspension design. Right. Caster is a little bit more difficult to visualize. So when the steered wheels are turned, they're pivoting around an axis. And the axis that they're pivoting around is a component called a kingpin. Now, that kingpin, it's not vertical. So it's actually it's actually angled rearward. If you were to imagine that you extended an imaginary line of that axis from the kingpin down to the ground, it would actually intersect the ground ahead of the tire. So ahead of the contact patch of the tire. So the wheel is slightly behind the pivot point. 
And that's called trail or mechanical trail. And it's because the tire trails behind the axis. Yeah. And that trail is called by, uh, I'm sorry, it's, that's the, the distance is called trail, but that whole feature is called the caster. So the trail then, that's the feature that causes wheels to self-center. So that's the effect where as you're coming out of a corner, the steering wheel will, will straighten itself up. And a very good example of that would be actually a shopping trolley. So we think of caster wheels on a shopping trolley. So if you think every time you push a shopping trolley, the wheels naturally fall in line behind the shopping trolley. And that's that's caster. That's caster because I my Series 3 I was driving out at the weekend, my Land Rover. When you come around a corner, you can literally let the steering wheel do its own thing and it will straighten up. Yep. So that, that's, that's that angle. It's the kingpin. It's called the kingpin inclination angle. And that's caster that's, that's causing that. Right. So less steering effort is required. Yeah, less steering effort. So, you know, as tire technology improved and as the road surfaces went from graded gravel to concrete or asphalt, and actually as the tire sizes increased as well, you know, the wheels just got bigger, the amount of effort that was required to turn the steering wheels, it, you know, it started becoming uncomfortably high. So initially the solution was just to have a larger diameter steering wheel. So you yeah. had these, you know, you think of those 50s cars, again, those 50s movies with those big steering wheels, you know. Yeah. I'm even thinking of my 1965 Volvo Amazon has a big steering wheel. Yeah, big- exactly, exactly. But, you know, there's a there's an obvious problem of the driver getting in and out of the car, right? It's it's restricting that. So so then engineers started to look for assisted means of of um, uh, of providing assistance for the for the steering effort. So uh, you're taking uh, taking us through what power assisted steering is. Yeah, exactly. So the first power assistance was actually uh, in 1903 on a truck called a Columbia, and they put separate electric motors on the wheels to directly help push the wheel. So kind of quite quite a crude one. The first production car that had power assisted steering was in the US, and that was a, a 1951 Chrysler Imperial, and that's a, a hydraulically driven pump helping to um, increase the effort on the steering. Okay, stupid question time. Is this system driving the wheels of the car turning or making it easier for the steering wheel? So what it's doing is it's uh, as the steering box in the 50s American cars, as they're pushing that pitman arm, the pump is actually putting force onto that. So it's just helping it actuate, helping it actuate more. Fine, thank you. Um, power assistance more common on US cars? Right? Yeah, yeah. It was always seen more, much more commonly in US cars. Uh, you know, that's driven because, you know, the, in, in generally the cars in the in general, the cars in the US were much larger. They're much bigger. They're much heavier. And as well as that, they also, as we talked a minute ago, they kept that recirculated um, bowl steering box. And that had a lot of inherent um, heaviness in the steering as well. Power assistance in Europe, it was really just reserved for the higher end cars. Again, they tended to be the bigger cars, right? Sort of the, the, the Jaguars and things like that. And and on those cars, power assistance is it's needed really at slower speeds. You know, that's how it becomes a more of a problem. Yeah, I remember learning to drive in the 80s and you, you know, you, you never turn the steering wheel when you're stationary and you always turn the steering wheel when you have motion, then it becomes easier because you need more assistance when traveling slowly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And actually in Europe then. In 1970, the Citroen SM, so that was introduced with speed variable power assistance. So if you think of it, this is this is a force that's actuating. It's an actual force that's actuating on the steering to make it lighter. Now, you want to make less effort when you're at slow speed maneuvering. But if you put that same amount of assistance in when you're driving at higher speed, you actually reduce the feel for the driver. So Citroen system it changed the level of force. It changed the level of power assistance that was actuated on the steering, depending on how fast the car was going. Ah, very good. So I didn't, I mean, it's funny. That system, I know that system in a modern car, I never thought it came in as far back as 1970. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's right. So how's that system powered then? Well, they're all hydraulic, actually. So, um, so you know, nearly all the cars through the sort of the you know last hundred years that had power assist did steering it was all hydraulically assisted so it's pumps hydraulic pumps that are driven by the engine um so the steering it's mechanically connected as we talk about through the rack or through the steering box and then the pump drives hydraulic lines that help to push the steering arm but the steering column itself when it rotates it opens or closes valves and that ensures that the hydraulics are always pushing in the direction you want to push it in obviously Right. Okay. So if these then they're driven by the engine, I take it. So how do 
electric cars drive their power assistance pumps? Well, in the 1980s, so still on combustion engine cars, so some yeah. manufacturers started to decouple the hydraulic pump from the engine by using an electric motor to drive the hydraulic pump. Yeah. So these are called electrohydraulic pumps. The first production car with an electrohydraulic pump was the 1988 Subaru XT6. So it's an Australian two-seater coupe. And then in 1990, on the second generation Toyota MR2, um, they also had an electric hydraulic pump. And on the MR2, so the MR2 is a it's a mid, mid-engine sports car. So that has an advantage because they didn't need to run hydraulic lines from the engine, which is behind the driver, to the steering rack, which is in front of the driver. They could just put that pump directly up, up where the rack was. So it saved less, less fitting in, in the engine bay and less cost to manufacture. Exactly. So less components is always the drive, right? And then the next development then was to remove the hydraulics entirely, actually, and just use an electric motor to provide that assistance. So directly actuating on the steering. The first production car with an electric steering pump, it's a very odd looking thing. It's a 1988 Suzuki Servo. So it's a very strange, it's a small urban car. And the best way I can describe it, it's it's half hatchback, half van, very strange looking thing. Um, so, you know, very limited market in Japan. Yeah. The problem in general with the early attempts at electric motors is that the, the motor itself reduced the steering feel. So the manufacturers then kind of kept improving the motor performance and kept improving the steering feel. So by the time we got to sort of the end of the 90s, there were a number of cars that actually had electric electric only assistance. So the MGF, Fiat Punto, Toyota Prius, Mazda RX-8, all those cars just had an electric motor driving it. So now today, electric cars either use electric motors or electric hydraulic pumps. Excellent. Very good. And Mazda RX-8 myself, I did enjoy the steering of it. So electric cars, and they, they really don't do anything differently to combustion engines. Oh, uh, well, so not in terms of just the steering system up front, but electric cars do have another trick uh, up their sleeve in terms of steering, and it's called torque vectoring. So some electric vehicles have separate motors. So the, the, the wheels, the individual wheels are driven by different motors. Mm. And on those cars, because they're driven by different motors, it means it different levels of torque can be applied to individual wheels. So as you go through a corner, by giving the outer wheels more torque, and the inner wheels less torque, you can actually increase the lateral acceleration. So, so the speed with which the car changes direction, and that dramatically improves the performance. And, and that's something that electric cars can do because they have those separate motors. So you can, you can literally throw the car into the corner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, like so, the, it it's if you it's funny if you think of if things like a tank, like a military tank, right? Think of how a military tank turns. The outside tracks turn, the inside tracks don't turn or turn in reverse. It's the same principle. It's just putting more power on on the driven wheel, so it's pushing the outside of the car around much quicker. Right. So then, if if the rear wheels are being driven, are they helping the steering in their push? Yeah. Right. So, you know. As you might expect in a conversation about steering, we're mostly talking about the front wheels, right? The front axle. But actually, the rear wheels also do play a story here. Now, obviously, the ability for the car to corner, it's a combination of the request from the front wheels and then the response of the rear wheels, right? So the so the rear wheels are following through, right? Now, how the wheels and the suspension systems operate you know, that affects how they operate together. That affects the vehicle handling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's something we'll talk about in a lot more detail, actually in the next two episodes. So suspension next and vehicle dynamics in, um, in the episode after that. But there are rear wheel steering systems that play more of a, more of a, a direct role, actually. So uh, forklift trucks, forklift trucks. Yeah, so, so forklift trucks, you know, that's a good example in terms of they actually steer from the rear. But I'm talking about, uh, road cars that have front axle steering, so regular uh, road cars. So there are a number of systems developed in the 70s and 80s where the rear wheel also turned to aid the steering, so either passively or actively. Now, the key challenge with rear wheel steering is that the rear wheels need to steer differently under different situations. Oh. So in low speeds or in tight corners, the rear wheels need to steer in the opposite direction to the front. So they so they they provide that, that very sharp corner. But at high speed, where there's very little steering effort. So for example, if you're changing lanes, 
in that case, the rear wheels actually turn in the same direction as the front wheels, and you sort of have this gliding gliding effect. Is that, so, called, is that called crabbing? Uh, crabbing is, is is when a car is, uh, yeah, so that would be when it's doing that because it's been badly set up or there's something gone wrong. Yeah, you would you would go sideways. Yeah, so in this case, it's designed in to move, to, to move sideways across the lane. Mm. Um, in 1986, Nissan actually launched uh, what they call the the high cast system on the Skyline, the R31 Skyline, and so this was this was active. It was speed dependent, and it was four wheel four wheel steering. And then in '87, Honda introduced a very similar system on the Prelude, and it's probably the one people would know actually more so. Actually, uh, there are other versions though. Um, Mazda on the '66 and the MX-6 in '88, they had electronic four wheel steering. Mm. And GMC trucks, so the Silverado and the Suburban trucks, they had a four-wheel steer system called Quadra Steer. Now that uh, that only moved in the opposite direction, or they only moved the rear wheels in the opposite direction to the front wheels. Yeah. But even still today, so like the Porsche Taycan and the Panamera, they have four-wheel steer options, and even very high-performance cars like the Ferrari F12 the GT4, sorry, GTC4 and the Lamborghini Aventador, they all have options for four-wheel steering so systems. even in a high-performance car like that, like a Ferrari F12, it's a hell of an animal and a machine to perform and then you throw on four-wheel steering system as well. Yeah. Jeez, That's right. all off the yeah. scale. So yeah. they're yeah. active systems. Tell us about the passive systems. Well, the funny thing is actually, most people wouldn't realize this, but nearly every car on the road today has some form of active passive rear wheel steering. So as the engineer's understanding of vehicle develop, the dynamics and ability to model increased kind of through the 70s into the 80s. And as their understanding of the rubber bushings in particular, so the compliance in the rubber bushings and how those those rubber bushings worked, as those levels of understanding became more advanced, the engineers were able to put in very advanced passive control of the rear wheels. So today, most cars, the rear in most cars, the rear suspension is designed so that as the car corners, the lateral forces that are acting on the suspension, they use the compliance in the bushings to actually turn the rear wheels a little bit inward, so to tow them in. And that improves the, profi- the precision and the feel of the car at the, the turn-in point. And so that generates more confidence. And it also reduces an effect called lift-off oversteer, where um, as you de- if you decelerate hard, and then like you brake harder, you take off your foot off the, off the throttle and you turn in, you would have a situation where the car would spin. So it, it reduces that as well. So that's actually on nearly all cars today. So without us knowing it, sort of the rear wheels are actually making us feel like more capable drivers. There you go. And without us knowing it, we needed an automotive consulting engineer to be able to tell us that, Mr. Mike Keen. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of this episode. Um, thank you for joining us in our next episode, episode 11. We're going to look at the history and explore the history of suspension systems. See you then. Thank you for joining us today on the Talking the Talk podcast. My thanks to Mike Keane, and you can check out his consultancy on mikekeane.ie. Then check out irelandmade.ie to view our back catalogue of videos celebrating stories of Irish transport, past and present. We look forward to welcoming you onto our next episode where we further explore the origins of automotive technology. You can find us on YouTube or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe and tell your friends. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.